you don't have to go through construction and permitting and utility interconnection and all of those things that slow down these projects. Greetings, Earthlings, and welcome back to Earthlings 2.0, the show where we imagine how we can be better versions of ourselves and build a collective future we actually want to live in. I'm your host, Lisa Ann Pinkerton. I'm the CEO of the award-winning PR firm Technica Communications and founder of Women in Clean Tech and Sustainability. Prior to this, I was an award-winning environmental science reporter for NPR and PBS. And whether this is your first or 50th episode, thank you so much for listening every week. We really love bringing you amazing content from around the world, earthlings doing cool things. And today's tech spotlight is one of those episodes. We're going to be talking about energy storage and how one company is democratizing energy for folks who may rent or don't have the capacity to increase their energy efficiency in their home, but they can still save some money on their energy costs with this simple energy storage device. So if you like what you're hearing, check us out on the links in the show notes, social media, take our listener survey so we can understand a little bit more about who you are and what content you like. Join our Substack newsletter. And also, if you'd like to contribute to the financial health of the Earthlings 2.0 podcast, we humbly ask you to join our Patreon page. And if you really enjoy the show, please consider sharing this show with a friend to help us grow our community. Okay, our tech spotlight is with Blip Energy. It's a startup that is dedicated to making energy storage accessible to millions of homes, and especially those who are generally left out of the energy innovation conversation. Our guest today is Sophia Winsett, and she's the CEO and co-founder of Blip Energy. Her background is in mechanical engineering and human-centered design, which has driven Blip's mission to provide this more accessible energy storage. So welcome, Sophia, to the show. Thanks so much. Great to be here. I wanted to ask you, first off, tell us the story about how Blip Energy came to be. How did you come up with this idea? I was living in apartments. I've lived in apartments or multi-units since I left for college. And the power went out for 36 hours, and I was just struck by the fact that there weren't any solutions for me, and that meant that there weren't any solutions for millions of other Americans and people across the globe. So I just started looking into it. Um, Why doesn't anything work for multi-unit? Why hasn't there been innovation in this space? I found a couple of reasons. I mean, one is the cost of technology is coming down. So it's now possible to build a product like this that's at a renter-friendly price point. And the other is really that energy innovation till now, especially in the residential or home space, has focused on taking the solutions that work for big industrial installations and scaling them down to fit a home. But that only fits a very specific kind of home. And so in this modern world, we're moving every couple of years. We don't know where we're going to be. It it doesn't make sense for everyone to put panels on their roof. So designing for those folks in in particular. I I, I used to rent. I know exactly that problem. And... We tried never to use our air conditioners because they were the most energy inefficient, probably the cheapest AC units the apartment building could buy. They were probably 15 years old easily. And every time we ran the AC unit, even for maybe half a day, the energy bill for the whole month was double. I think that's a, that's a problem that's only getting worse for folks as we we as an energy system need to make a ton of upgrades to support electrification to support wind and solar to update old transmission lines we end up paying for that because they need to get money from somewhere to do all that construction so electric bills are only going up and they're changing to this variable rate system where overnight it's a cheaper cost and then later in the evening when everybody's getting home from school and work and turning everything on the price of electricity goes up because they don't want people using as much energy during that window. But what are we supposed to do? Turn everything off, not get home from work. Um, So what we can do with our battery is charge up overnight when that cost is cheap and then use that power that we charged at the cheaper rate during the window when energy otherwise spikes. So we can save people 50 to $400 on their electric bill, depending on what that rate is. 
So tell me about this battery specifically. Describe it for us. Absolutely. So it's a, a standalone battery. It has some of the features of a camping battery, some of the features of an uninterruptible power supply, some of the features of a, a smart plug. Um, but basically, it's a standalone system that plugs straight into a regular wall outlet, connects to your local Wi-Fi, sets up in two minutes, and you plug a window or a wall air conditioner directly into the battery. So from there, we can do the rest. We're intelligently charging the battery overnight or whenever it's cheapest. If you have rooftop solar, we can charge up on excess solar. So we're charging whenever it's lowest cost, and then we're using that cheap power to run your AC whenever the cost is otherwise really expensive. We can also aggregate these batteries and use them to support the grid. Um, they don't want you to use power in that window either. That's why they made the price more expensive. So we're able to participate in some of those grid services, and that's how we keep the cost of the battery really low for end users because we're able to generate our revenue from that. And if we look at the pictures, it, it almost looks like a really tall computer. It's just this box, or it could look like a, a tall um, air purifier. You know, it's, it's got some good design to it, um, and it could just sit next to, I guess, the wall unit and your couch, and just, it, it, it almost blends in with the furniture. I, I like how you've designed this. Thank you. And so it's plugged into the wall, and then the AC unit or the other high-load uh, appliance is plugged into that device. Yep. And and then you're able to manage the energy. So tell me a little bit more about these grid services. Explain this to us for folks who might not understand what that piece of the puzzle is. How, what are you doing yeah. specifically? So utilities have a really hard job. They need to make sure that at every moment in time, the amount of energy that we're generating is equal to or greater than the amount of energy being consumed. And so when they're doing that balancing act, as consumption starts to go up, as everyone gets home from work and school, it's a really hot day and everyone's running the air conditioner, they can do a couple things. They can turn on more power generation. They typically do that with fuel burning power plants, coal or natural gas plants, or they can decrease the amount of energy that's being consumed. So that's called either load shifting or demand response, but they're basically taking the, the amount of energy that's being demanded by all of the things that we're running in our homes and finding ways to decrease that. So we can respond to uh, a demand response signal or a load shifting program, and they're in the same window where people, where the price spikes, so it's not in conflict with saving people money on their electric bill. They keep all their electric bill savings, and then we support the grid by responding to those demand response calls um, to lower demand so they don't have to turn on another coal plant to service all the air conditioners that are running. And we see this a lot in the summer times, and you'll hear, uh, like the city of New York is attempting to get people to to uh, to reduce reduce their load or pre cool their apartments to because mm -hmm. they understand that there's going to be a big demand spike. And the great thing about what we've designed is that it doesn't require you to turn your air conditioner off, right? We're not asking people to change their behaviors. We're just changing where that energy uh, when that energy is being stored and then using that cheaply stored or uh, stored from wind power that may be running overnight. And what, what's the size of the battery? What kind of chemistry are you using? So it's a 2.5 kilowatt hour battery. Um, we're using lithium iron phosphate or LFP chemistry. Okay, so 2.5 kilowatts. Explain that in layman's terms for folks. How much energy is that? It's a fraction of an electric vehicle. Those are usually like 60 kilowatts, kilowatt hours. Um, so 2.5 kilowatt hours could run an air conditioner for about four hours, a window air conditioner for about four hours, which is usually that window, could charge a laptop 40 times, could run a refrigerator for one to two days if the power goes out. Thank you. And I like that you're using LFP uh, chemistry, lithium ferrous phosphate, also known as lithium iron phosphate. And um, I have a lot of experiences with that chemistry from back in the day with Technica representing some companies. And and I don't think people understand, like we hear a lot about, oh, battery fires with some of these EVs or in New York, they're having a lot of fires related to charging uh, mobility transportation devices like scooters and, and e-bikes, right? Yeah. Uh, but not all chemistries are the same. And so LFP is one that isn't prone to thermal runaway, which is what creates those big chemical fires. Our, that's exactly why we chose them because they're the most thermally stable. So that's the number one reason. The other is that they're using um, iron and phosphorus. So much more widely available chemicals, not the cobalt that you may have seen on the news 
um, are those other uh, rare earth minerals that are that are harder to get and that are wreaking a little bit more havoc on our planet. Where is the company now in its trajectory? You've got this product, and um, uh, have you started selling it yet? We're pre-commercial launch, so we're doing our first pilots this summer. So we've got a couple of partners, some utilities, some actually commercial buildings, because offices have a lot of the same challenges that renters do. So uh, a commercial building that has a bunch of window air conditioners. So our, our utility pilots with residential customers, we have another commercial pilot and three or four more in the pipeline. So right now we're testing all of the technology. We're gathering a ton of data to continue to build our, our algorithm, that decision engine that's telling the battery what to do when. Uh, we're targeting a commercial launch sometime in late 25, early 26. Um, we received a grant from the Department of Energy that we're extremely thrilled about. So it's great to see that they are supporting this approach of this sort of drop-in, self-contained, distributed energy resource. I think they're seeing what utilities are, which is that the, the lead times are really long for installing batteries, installing solar. We need some more things that we can deploy today. So pilots now, uh, commercial launch upcoming. So because you're doing these pilots with these utilities, do you anticipate that you'll sell your product sort of in conjunction with the utility to their ratepayers, or will people be able to purchase this directly? Long term, direct purchase definitely uh, will be on the table. Right now, we want to be a little bit more geographically focused. So for us, for the grid, it's more valuable to have 100 of these in one region, one utility region, than 100 randomly across the US. So we're being a little bit more targeted as we start, but accessibility is part of our mission. We want people to be able to get their hands on these. We do think that we'll work with utilities long-term. In this pilot, we have a lot of utilities that are very excited. Uh, we have a big utility conglomerate that's actually a strategic investor in us. Um, so we know that they're excited about it and there's a couple different ways that we can work with them. One is by becoming a certified product in the suite of uh, sort of energy efficiency or smart home devices. So you saw that with a lot of smart thermostats, which also play in this demand response space. Um, so that's a great way for us to get into people's homes. Utilities provide rebates um, so that the cost of the battery is even lower. And then we've also talked to some utilities about them um, purchasing and actually just deploying these units in climate justice and lower uh, income communities where there's even more of a need. There's a lot of folks experiencing energy poverty, which is when you're foregoing purchases of food or medicine because you have to pay your, your utility bills. So definitely looking to work with utilities long-term, um, but also wanna make sure that this is accessible as we get to a scale where direct sales are possible. Yeah, and, 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 and also a lot of those uh, natural gas peaker plants and uh, are located within disadvantaged communities. Absolutely. So there's, there's an air pollution aspect to this that people are experiencing higher asthma rates and other health concerns we don't always draw the connection between having to spin up those peaker plants to meet energy demand and the health concerns and quality of life that people living around those have so i feel like there's a good connection between what you're doing with this battery and some of the problems that people are facing beyond just yeah. energy costs yeah when we think about impact we're looking at what are people saving on their electric bill, but also how much are we reducing the need for peakers, not just GHG emissions, but also all of those pollutants and, and negative health effects that come from running those plants. Mm -hmm. so, so how do you see Blip Energy changing the future of how we use energy with this product? How are you creating a new timeline for us, if I can use a sci-fi? Right. Yeah, absolutely. I love a new timeline. Um, so I think that our our approach is a little bit different than how we're seeing a lot of other folks approach this. I said at the top that a lot of energy innovation has taken these big solar plus storage systems and tried to scale them down. We're focused on how can we make the biggest impact with the lowest friction. So we have a platform, right? It's that decision engine for the battery, but also batteries that can apply in a lot of different verticals. We're starting with this window air conditioner, um, but we also have some potential clients in the refrigeration space with convenience stores and grocery stores. We have some potential clients in the industrial space. We're taking the same approach, right? Smack a big battery on the biggest user of energy because you can do that immediately. You don't have to go through construction and permitting and utility interconnection and all of those things that slow down these projects and keep stakeholders, businesses, homeowners, tenants from making and accessing some of this technology that's out there. Um, so our goal is to really change the way that 
folks are approaching energy, it doesn't have to be the 100% solution every time. You can still make a big impact with the 80% solution that's 20% of the cost. So we're hoping that we can change that paradigm a little bit. All right, thank you very much, Sophia. Appreciate you being on the show and congratulations with everything you're working on. Also, congratulations on winning the Women in Clean Tech and Sustainability Pitch Competition. I was remiss in not mentioning that at the top of the show. So I, I'm really excited about what you've created here and, and how you're opening up uh, energy storage to folks who don't usually have access to it. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you for your, your support, for uh, your support of Women in Queen Tech and Sustainability. Uh, it's been great speaking with you and I'm excited to, to keep in touch. Thanks so much for having me. You're welcome. We'll see you again on another turn of this beautiful blue green space flower that we call home. <laughs>